opportunity to do that will obviously uh, make our position clear to the families and to the court. Thank you. Uh, we now move to the next item of business, which is a statement by Derek Mackay on the Fourth Road Bridge. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement, and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. Members who wish to question the Minister should press the request to speak button now, and I'll give a few seconds for the front benches to organise themselves. I now call on Derek Mackay, Minister, 15 minutes. Presiding Officer, I am grateful to Parliament for the opportunity to make a statement on the Forth Road Bridge. As you will be aware, a necessary decision was taken to close the Forth Road Bridge to all traffic, cyclists and pedestrians on the night of Thursday, Thursday 3rd of December. I would like to update Parliament on the reasons for closure, provide information on the mitigation measures which have been implemented and the next steps that we are taking to repair the bridge and return it to normal operation at the earliest opportunity. Firstly, I would like to thank communities around the Forth Road Bridge, commuters and road users for their continued patience at this time. I would also like to reassure them that we are aware of the significant impact of this situation and that we are working with all our partners to minimise the impact where we can. This is an issue of national significance and with everyone playing their part we can limit the impact on the local, regional and national economy. Following the discovery of a serious defect near the North East Tower on Tuesday 1st of December during a routine inspection the decision was taken to restrict traffic to the northbound carriageway away from the defect area. Detailed analysis of traffic and different traffic load scenarios was then undertaken to evaluate the structure and determine if it was safe to keep the bridge in operation. Results on the morning of Thursday 3rd of December showed that the existing restrictions needed to be augmented with a further restriction on vehicles over 7.5 tonnes except buses which had been modelled into the load analysis. The defect affected one of the two truss end links which support the main truss at the North East Tower. If a further failure had occurred, then support would have been lost to the end of the main span stiffening truss, which would drop by between 150 and 700 millimetres, depending on the loading at the time. This would mean that the load will be redistributed across the link in the North West Tower, increasing loads on the other elements. The carriageways would also drop, further damaging the structure. This kind of damage is a likely outcome and would require bridge closure for a repair which could last several months. The operating company, AMI, conducted a series of additional inspections and testing on the welds and joints to the other truss end link immediately after the initial defect was found. The first focus was to inspect the welds of the adjacent member now carrying additional load from the failed member. The results of this inspection and testing were completed by late afternoon on Thursday 3rd of December and presented to Transport Scotland. The outcome showed that cracking having started at the same weld location and spreading along the load carrying weld at the critical pin joint. At this stage, the extent is small, but the implications are large. The main truss of the bridge relies on this joint to be at full strength to cope with the additional loading due to the adjacent defect. With continual loading, our experts concurred that the identified crack is likely to propagate, leading to the failure of the remaining truss end link. The timescales for this to occur cannot be estimated as there are a large number of factors involved, many of which cannot be fully quantified at this current stage. However, by removing the remaining traffic load from the structure, this reduces the loads and stresses on the remaining truss end link and ensures that the travelling public are not put at risk. As a result, the decision was taken to close the bridge to all traffic from midnight on Thursday 3rd of December in order to help safeguard the integrity of the structure. It is anticipated that following the completion of a successful repair, the bridge will reopen in time for people to return to work in the new year. The decision to close the Forth Road Bridge was not taken lightly. It is firmly based on the expert opinion of the engineers who operate the bridge day to day and that of independent experts in the field. Every effort is being made to open the bridge as quickly as possible, but safety is the main priority. 
Unfortunately, these works are weather dependent given the height and location of defect on the bridge. We are aware of the potential economic impact for strategic traffic in the east of Scotland and on people living in local communities. This is an unprecedented challenge in the operation of the fourth road bridge. On balance, following advice from engineers and independent experts, full closure is the right decision and is essential for the safety of the travelling public and to prevent further damage to the structure of the bridge. The bridge operators, Amy, have a robust inspection regime in place which aligns with industry standards for a structure of this nature. This regime is a continuation of the methodology used by the Fourth Estuary Transport Authority, FETA. Due to the thorough nature of this regime, specialist engineers are confident in their view that these defects are problems that have only occurred in the last few weeks. We're taking every step we can to alleviate the impact of this closure. Action taken last week will mean that any closure will be much shorter than it might have been if we had waited to take action. We continue to work closely with all partners to coordinate our efforts to alleviate the impact of this closure. Every effort and resource available is being deployed to repair the damage to the Fourth Road Bridge and minimise the disruption to the public. To be clear, the Fourth Estuary Transport Authority, FETA, reports that are being discussed in the media refer to the other end of the truss end link where it connects with the North Tower at the top and not to the pin joint at the base of the link where this defect has materialised. Works to the top of the truss end link were already underway. Specialist engineers believe that this new defect identified on Tuesday as part of a routine inspection has only occurred in the past few weeks. Based on the advice and evidence that we've received from specialist engineers and for the avoidance of doubt, we believe that the current fault is entirely unrelated to the above project and there is no indication that the ongoing repair project in the towers has caused the defect. The Scottish Government has fully funded all FETA programmes since taking over the funding of the annual grant in 2008 and prior to the dissolution of FETA earlier this year, FETA made decisions on their programme and priorities of repairs completely independent of Transport Scotland. The timing of the closure was communicated to the public within minutes of ministers taking this difficult decision and was covered on evening news programmes advising of the closure and the measures to take when travelling on Friday morning. Local authorities were involved from early stages and undertook to inform their communities where possible. There is ongoing consultation with business organisations such as Scottish Enterprise, Federation of Small Business, Chamber of Commerce and the Road Haulage Association. We're also in discussions with other partners such as Police Scotland, other emergency services, NHS Scotland and public transport operators to minimise disruption and deliver our contingency plans. A comprehensive travel plan was launched for commuters in affected communities on Sunday afternoon to allow people to plan their trips for the working week ahead. We have also created a dedicated website which had over 80, 85,000 hits on Sunday. And this has details of the travel plan along with some questions and answers to help people tailor their own travel plans. That comprehensive travel plan was put in place in time for the Monday commute to work. With 100,000 people using the bridge every day, delays and longer journeys are inevitable, so it is important that everyone, workers and employers, are flexible in working arrangements during this period. Together with the public transport operators, we too will be flexible. The plan will be monitored and adjusted to give the best possible service to the travelling public. Additional rail capacity has been provided by ScotRail as part of the full travel plan. This was made available to the travelling public on Sunday to allow them to plan for their journeys to work on Monday. As a result of our monitoring, it has been modified to accommodate commuters where possible. And in response to passenger demand, an extra early morning train has been laid on, leaving Inverkeithing before 6am. Overall, an extra 8,000 seats are now being provided and this will increase further. Additional subsidised bus services have also been provided. 33 extra buses providing 11,000 additional seats, along with bus priority measures. These have allowed for reliable journey times to Edinburgh, even in peak periods. 
Both bus and rail services are being served by dedicated park and ride sites at Halbeath and Ferry Toll, and we continue to work closely with Fife Council to monitor the operation of these sites. A dedicated HGV and bus route was implemented from Monday morning, and this involves segregating traffic and ensuring that we put measures in place to prioritise bus movements to get the maximum number of people to work and to ensure that the journey times for HGVs were improved, reducing any impact on the economy. The travel plan also included alternative routes for road users using the Kincardine and Clackmanninshire Bridge. Uh, updates to the public were, uh, and are continuing to be broadcast using Traffic Scotland via the website, Twitter feed and Travel Line Scotland app, as well as Traffic Scotland Radio and ScotRail and Stagecoach are also providing regular updates. This will be monitored throughout the bridge closure and adapted as necessary. And I'd like to thank the local communities of those areas for their patience throughout, as I'm sure this will cause some additional disruption to them. Indeed, following our monitoring of the HGV and bus route, the restrictions on this route have been relaxed between the hours of 8 p.m. and 5 a.m. to help ease the impact on local communities. The plan is in place and today's situation is as follows. Rail services commenced with the additional service at 5.52, which carried approximately 160 passengers. Services between Edinburgh and Fife have been busy and were strengthened where possible to cope with additional passenger flows. Queuing systems have been in place at stations in Fife and ScotRail staff are in attendance at all stations. The 613 from Dalgetty Bay was full with no room for 60, 70 passengers at Inverkeithing nor a further 25 at Recife. This service, as I understand it, was the only instance where passengers have been unable to board this morning, but all those passengers were accommodated on the next train. The roundabouts at the A977, A907, Gartare, and the A977, A876, Kalbagi, and the M876, A876, and A985, Hounds Newark, were heavily congested during the morning peak, but continued to move. Fife Council also reported problems on the coast road through Kilross. Congestion at the A9 at Broxton Roundabout was heavy at times, whilst the temporary traffic management at the A9 Keir Roundabout worked well and kept the strategic traffic flowing. At 9.30, the roads were running free, while still busy at the key roundabouts. The bus HGV prioritisation on the A985 between Kearney Hill and Longanet Roundabouts operated well and facilitated park and ride buses from Ferry Toll and Halbeath. Stagecoach reported bus journey time of between 1 hour and 30 minutes and 1 hour 45 minutes. Uptake of the park and ride was low, however, with loadings averaging 12% at Halbeath and 7% at Ferry Toll, and we're doing everything we can to encourage further use of this bus service. I would like to remind everyone that the successful implementation of this plan depends on the choices people make and we would again encourage the public to use these additional public transport services, particularly bus services. Emergency vehicles will still be able to use the bridge in blue light situations, and arrangements have also been made with NHS Scotland in respect of other critical medical appointments. A call, uh, chaired by the Deputy First Minister, was held this morning with business organisations, and this was an opportunity to share information and identify any practical steps that could be taken. A number of suggestions have been made by business and ministers have committed to look at them all in detail. This is an unprecedented transport challenge. The safety of the travelling public is of paramount importance and the decisions that we have taken will ensure this is maintained. Specialists are working day and night to return the bridge to normality and we will fix the problem as soon as we possibly can. We continue to work with all partners in the emergency services to manage the impact of the closure and to help ensure that diversions operate as efficiently as possible. And we will continue to share all travel information through the dedicated website. Members of this parliament will be aware of the issues previously raised regarding the suspension cables on the bridge and the subsequent action taken by FETA to mitigate the impact and halt any further deterioration. The residual risk 
of a potentially lengthy future full bridge closure remained, supporting a decision to progress with a fourth replacement crossing. Thank you, Alec Rowley. Thank you, Sir, and I would thank the Minister for an advanced copy of, of his speech. The gravity of this situation and the impact on thousands of people and their ability to get to and from their work cannot be understated. We believe the Scottish Government took the right decision to shut the bridge as public safety must be the absolute priority. I would also want to acknowledge that the Minister has worked hard over the last few days to keep the focus of the Government on people and on businesses affected by putting in place the emergency measures that he has. I would want to say to the Minister that it is important that people have a way of feeding back and feeding in what is working and what is not working. My party will continue to work with the Government to ensure that we are able to do everything possible to support people get to work and support businesses impacted. The Minister referred to reports in the media about what has gone wrong and why, but to be clear, it is not just the media that is asking questions. How has this fault developed? Yesterday we had a top engineer claim that the key maintenance on the bridge was cancelled in 2010. We know that two senior engineers on the Forth Road Bridge resigned. It is understood that these specialists with years of experience on the bridge left because the operation and maintenance of the bridge was effectively privatised. What is the impact and what impact has privatisation of the bridge had on the availability of the expertise and ultimately on the ongoing maintenance of the bridge? We know that in 2012, Audit Scotland confirmed there had been a capital funding cut to the bridge. We know that in 2007, Transport Scotland identified repairs needed on the bridge that were never carried out. People have questions and people need answers, and that is why today I am calling for a parliamentary inquiry into the circumstances leading up to this crisis. I believe that a parliamentary inquiry is in the public interest, and I hope that the Minister and the Government will support such an inquiry. Minister. Can I actually thank Alec Rowley for his uh, participation over the course of the last number of days. The uh, key um, communication has been important in terms of suggestion as to how to improve the travel plan and share the message uh, around safety. I think it's a fair comment and question around the use of social media and information sharing and also listen to the public and to communities and we're doing that uh, in real time as we've adapted the travel plan uh, for example, in lifting the restrictions uh, on the, the priority corridor. So we are engaging with community, with elected members, parliamentarians and local authorities and businesses, and I think that that's the right thing to do, to listen uh, and to respond. In terms of the fault that's been identified, let me be clear, this fault was not predicted. This fault was not identified. This is not a location uh, of the member that was deemed to be overstressed. Therefore, it wasn't uh, predictable and separate works were already uh, underway uh, on the rest of the member, but this specific part of the element uh, was not predicted to fail or to crack uh, in the way that it has. Because of the comprehensive inspections uh, and the daily and weekly inspections, it's that uh, information that leads our expert engineers to conclude that this fall has only occurred in the last few weeks. And hopefully, with the offer of a further technical briefing to parliamentarians, maybe that will assist in terms of the understanding of the technical uh, fault that has occurred. And we will be transparent uh, around the nature of this fault, which I think shows uh, that the government has taken uh, all appropriate action. In terms of funding, there are no critical repairs that were requested to be funded uh, by FETA that uh, haven't been funded uh, by Government or Transport Scotland. Uh, the operation and, and management of the bridge was independent uh, of the Government. It was led by that operating committee. Finance was in place to carry out the identified work programme. And indeed, the work programme that was developed by FETA uh, was being delivered by our operatives uh, through the new uh, operation. In terms of staffing and the current practices of the operator uh, Amy on the bridge, 
Uh, the impact of staffing is there's actually more people working at the bridge than was the case uh, before the transfer uh, on the 1st of June. And there's substantial, indeed, enhanced expertise for the bridge as part of the current uh, operating arrangements. And the nature of staff change is not as uh, Mr Rowley uh, has described. Indeed, most of the staff who were working on the bridge before transfer on the 1st of June are still working on the bridge and all the operating manuals, the history of the bridge uh, has been maintained. So there was a seamless transition from operators to ensure that continuity of work and indeed uh, this government through Transport Scotland and the operators have prioritised uh, elements of work that we inherited from FETA. Thank you. Can I thank the Minister for his statement and for an advanced copy of it? It hardly needs to be stated how damaging the closure of the bridge is for the economy of Fife and the east of Scotland more generally. I have been contacted by businesses who stand to lose considerable sums in an important trading period and by commuters who face weeks of disruption, additional cost and frustration. The efforts of the Scottish Government, its agencies and the transport companies to put alternative travel arrangements in place are appreciated. But there are still problems. And for now, the priority should be in resolving these. For example, this morning I used the ferry toll park and ride, which was very quiet, but I still find myself waiting 40 minutes for the promised shuttle bus to Inverkeething Rail Station, a little more than a mile away. In fact, I could have walked uh, the distance had I realised the wait was going to be so long. And while those travelling from Fife into the centre of Edinburgh have options they can use, there are many of my constituents who need to get to work in West Edinburgh, uh, Edinburgh Airport, elsewhere in the Lothians or in the Central Belt. What more can the Scottish Government do to provide them with public transport alternatives? Presiding officer, there are two other points I want to cover briefly if I can. Very firstly, briefly, Mr. Fraser. firstly, businesses which are losing large sums of money as a result of the closure are understandably calling for compensation. What proposals does the Scottish Government have to assist them? And finally, there has been a great deal of speculation, as Mr Rowley said, that the bridge closure was the result of inadequate maintenance. And we've heard from John Carson, who has blamed incompetence on the part of Transport Scotland. Will the Minister now agree we need a fully independent inquiry into what went wrong, reporting early as possible in the new year so we can find out the truth of the matter and learn lessons for the future? Minister. And can I thank Mardo Fraser for those questions and his support around the uh, public transport uh, alternatives. They have been strengthened. There's uh, real information uh, around that that's of assistance to the public. On the questions of alterations, improvements, we're looking at further strengthening the public transport interventions. And I'm happy to hear uh, any constructive suggestions as to how we may further uh, improve that as we uh, enhance what's currently uh, been uh, provided. In terms of business support, the Deputy First Minister has engaged with businesses this morning. Uh, as I've said in my statement, there will be a full consideration of the suggestions uh, made. But the key thing has to be to get this bridge open as quickly as possible, and we are working around the clock to do that. And the government has taken the right decision in the bridge closure so that the investigation, the preparation and the repair work can be carried out. And I believe we have averted a much more serious uh, structural incident, which I think would have been more damaging to the economy in the area uh, if that had uh, occurred. In terms of the transportation of goods and other support of businesses, that's why we've prioritised HGVs and we're looking at extending uh, that further to further support businesses. So by way of our uh, intervention, our prioritisation and our partnership working with businesses, we'll continue to do everything we can to support them at this very difficult time. Thank you. Can I say that we're very tight for time this afternoon? and I have absolutely no scope to extend this particular session. I am therefore going to give priority to the constituency and regional MSPs whose constituents are the most affected and those constituency and regional MSPs who indicated to me by the usual time their wish to ask a question. David Torrance, followed by Willie Rennie. Thank you, President Officer. Like myself and many of my constituents, who use rail to commute uh, to Edinburgh daily. Would the Minister clarify exactly what measures have been put in place on the rail network to minimise the disruption? And what discussions has the Minister had with local authorities on relaxation of parking restrictions and on an increase of available parking spaces? Minister. 
Presiding officer, I'll try and be briefer in my answers. In terms of rail, we have, through ScotRail, identified extra carriages to increase the, the number of carriages uh, a train's provided and uh, an extended uh, timetable. That's amounted to an extra 8,000 uh, seats provided, and in fact, that will be enhanced uh, further. Staffing is in place at all affected stations, and we're sharing that information uh, through the dedicated website. In terms of consultation with local authorities, they are key partners in this. They've worked in partnership with us to help, as have Police Scotland, uh, manage local traffic uh, impact, and they'll look at uh, activities such as removing unnecessary uh, roadworks to try and encourage a, flee, a free flow of traffic uh, where uh, possible, and we'll continue to engage with them in terms of our travel action plan. Will Rennie, followed by Cara Hilton. I thank the Minister for advance sight of um, his statement, but also for his engagement over the weekend. In particular, I was pleased with the announcement about chemo and radiotherapy patients in the special arrangements over the bridge. Um, I want to be clear with the Minister, however, that I expect him to return to Parliament for a proper examination of the decisions taken by Ministers in the last few years that may have contributed to the defect on the bridge today. But for today, people want to know what changes the Minister is going to make to the transport plan. In particular, will he agree to lift the restrictions on the A985 for off-peak during the daytime? This is having a dramatic impact on the local community and on traffic flows. I would appreciate if you could look at that again. Minister. It, well, I've said to Willie Rennie I'd invite him to take up the offer of a technical briefing. I believe Willie Rennie has, has done so and will do that uh, today, and, and that will give a fuller understanding of the technical issues that I've referenced in my uh, statement in terms of how this uh, fault has occurred. And as a listening government, we are adapting the travel plan to take account of local circumstances. There is ongoing monitoring of the traffic system uh, as well as uh, the demand for transport provisions such as the enhanced uh, rail services. There is more capacity on buses and on park and ride, and again, I'd encourage people to use that. The priority route is working in terms of the reliable journey time, but if we can relax it further to support business and communities, we will absolutely look at that in the way that we have lifted some of the restrictions to reflect what was working, what was rational, and what can make the biggest difference, and of course, remain open-minded to the right interventions. Cara Hilton, followed by Roderick Campbell. Thank you. As a constituency member covering Dunfermline and West Fife, there's very few in my constituents who haven't been detrimentally affected by the bridge closure. And I'm great, very grateful to the Minister for his speedy responses to the, the issues I've raised already. The Minister is aware that of the lack of parking at train stations. That's an ongoing issue in West Fife with spaces full before 8 o'clock in the morning. And the bridge is, um, closure is causing a real headache for the growing number of commuters who have got no option but to travel. On Friday, I wrote to the Minister asking that free shuttle buses be provided between Halbeath Park and Ride and local, local train stations. I would like to ask the Minister if he discussed this option with Stagecoach and if so, to let me know why this option isn't being pursued because it doesn't surprise me to hear that the uptake of Park and Ride is low. I mean, no commuter wants to spend two hours sat in a bus when they could be there in half the time if a free shuttle was provided to the local train station. So I would appreciate if the Minister would let me know what discussions have happened with Stagecoach because I think um, our frontline workers have got to be put before stage, uh, Stagecoach shareholders. So I appreciate if you would act in that. Minister. Well, the, the reason that Stagecoach has been deployed is, quite frankly, they're the largest uh, operator in the area. Uh, with that expertise, it's very useful to use them. And the extra buses that have been provided it has created the capacity. There's huge demand uh, on rail, and maybe that's because of the, the certainty uh, around that. But can I correct the, the, the journey time issue that Cara Hilton raised? The, the average journey time is actually an hour and a half, not two hours. And I think and I, and I think that Ms. That, Hilton. And I think that that compares quite well with people using the private car. And I understand some people will continue to, to, to require to use the, the car, but for those that can use public transport, I'd direct them towards the, the bus provision. I'd rather have more buses going to the uh, park and ride the railway stations. It's possibly more about trying to transfer some people maybe from queuing at stations onto the buses where there is that extra capacity. But again, I've been in regular communication with a number of members, including Cara Hilton. I'll, I have considered every suggestion put to me and worked that through the system, and many of them uh, have been implemented, and this will remain under constant uh, scrutiny, focus, and adaptation, if it makes sense. I need shorter questions, Roderick Campbell, followed um, by Claire Baker. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Minister, I have within my constituency one uh, business, 98% of whose goods are exported out of Scotland. So I'm grateful for those comments about the dialogue between the Deputy First Minister and business. Will that dialogue continue uh, so that th this urgent situation can be resolved? Minister. Y yes, it will. We'll have constant dialogue with the key business uh, re uh, representatives and, of course, major employers in the area. Clear Baker, followed by Bruce Crawford. Um, thank you. It is clear from questions around the Chamber that we would benefit from a parliamentary inquiry on this issue. Uh, the Minister has said it is anticipated that the bridge will be open for people returning to work in the new year. How confident is he of this timescale and which factors might lead to a delay? It is obviously of great concern to commuters in Fife, particularly shift workers, that we see the bridge open as soon as possible. Minister. The last briefing I had, which was just before I left the National Traffic Control Centre, where the multi-agency response is being coordinated to come to Parliament, was that the work is on track as per that timetable that has been published. Uh, factors that may change that, of course, is the fact that uh, the uh, works are weather dependent because we won't have people working in unsafe uh, conditions, but we are working around the clock to get the bridge open as quickly as possible. Bruce Crawford, followed by Jane Baxter. Thank you. Um, there, for those who are being critical, there's a slang phrase that recognises it lies full of unpredictable events, but I better not use that in here today. Um, but Minister, can, in, the, in that light, can you tell me what discussions you've had with the UK Government on the relaxation of rules for HGV drivers who may face issues around working hours as a result of diversions? Because I'm sure you'll recognise that the haulage industry is very important to the Scottish economy. Yes, Recognising the pressures on business and uh, the haulage industry, I move very quickly to have discussions with the Secretary of State uh, and he's had discussions with the Department for Transport and there will be uh, a relaxation of driver's hours to support businesses at this time. Jane Baxter, followed by Jim Eady. With 100,000 people using the bridge every day, it's clear that this entails a wide range of journey patterns and journey purposes. The Minister's statement made reference to a willingness to monitor and adjust the travel plan according to feedback. Can I ask whether any consideration has been given to offering a telephone helpline which would gather first-hand experience and provide reliable advice and information and so enhance the monitoring? Minister. There is a telephone helpline available through Transport Scotland and people uh, are able to use that and it has been scaled up in anticipation of demand. Jim Eady, followed by David Stewart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. While the main priority in the coming days and weeks must be the need to minimise disruption to the travelling public, once the bridge has reopened, will the Minister instruct a full and thorough assessment into the causes of the closure so that we can understand why we have arrived at this position and what lessons, if any, can be learned for the future? And what further assurances can he give that the Government will act to ensure that there is proper transparency and accountability in all of the historic decisions that were taken prior to Transport Scotland assuming responsibility for the bridge? Minister. That's a helpful question. We have shared a lot of the technical expertise that's come from expert engineers we can continue to do that as we update people on the progress uh, of the bridge. Of course, we'll review systems and inspections uh, and processes to ensure that if there are any lessons uh, to be learned, we will learn uh, from that. I think that's the right thing to do, considering the unprecedented nature uh, of this incident uh, and the closure and the impact. So I'll commit to do that. David Stewart, followed by Stuart Stevenson. Uh, President officer, after discussion with the haulage industry in Highlands Islands, I've got two very quick practical points. One is whether we can relax the driver's hours uh, issue, which I think Bruce Crawford raised, which I think is very important. And secondly, can we increase speed limits as an emergency measure on single carriageways to 50 miles an hour in light of what's happening currently in the A9? Minister. I, as I've addressed the issue of uh, driver's hours, there will be a relaxation, uh, and that's been uh, taken on board uh, between Scottish Government and uh, UK Government. However, on the issue of speed limits, uh, David Stewart and I have exchanged views on this uh, in the past. Uh, apart from the A9, where there's been a very specific package of measures put in place to allow for an increase in speed uh, for HGVs, I don't think it would be appropriate wholesale and I don't think it would be appropriate on this specific measure only because there would be an increased risk of fatalities and casualties uh, if there were more incidents and indeed south of the border when the UK government is increasing the, their national HGV limit in their own assessment they said there would be an increased risk of fatalities and casualties and I'm afraid that's not a gamble I'm willing to take with uh, lives in Scotland. Stuart Stevenson, followed by Alex Johnson. 
Uh, does the Minister recall my announcing in June 2007 that there would be a new bridge delivered in 2016? Was it a proper permanent response then and effective management now to be on schedule and £1 billion below the budget I announced in 2007? Minister. Presiding officer, I think it's fair to say that as well as all the other contingency plans that have been put into place as a consequence of the bridge closure, I think it's a rather substantial contingency plan, a decision made in 2007 to build that replacement crossing. And I think it shows that the government has been vindicated in building uh, a replacement fourth crossing, uh, which is very much on time and under budget. Alex Johnson, followed by Jackie Bailey. Does the Minister have any comment to make on the document published on the Public Contract Scotland website on the 25th of May 2010, which is headed Truss End Links, Forth Road Bridge, and the status of which is now cancelled? Minister. I have offered all political parties a full technical briefing and an explanation of uh, mitigation measures. The only party that I know that hasn't taken this up is the Conservatives, which is maybe why Alec Johnston is so ill-informed. I would have thought, in listening to the statement, some of this would have been uh, covered and understood by Mr Johnston. The key point here is that that was FETA in operation at the time. The works identified is not where the fault has occurred. This specific fault, this specific crack was not predicted. It has emerged in the last few weeks and identified on Tuesday. Recommendation to ministers on Thursday uh, and action taken within minutes uh, around that. Uh, FETA, uh, responsible uh, at the time, had a works programme that they were working through and hadn't uh, identified this. And in terms of the technical nature of that contract, FETA rescoped their own works. They were getting on with the job. Uh, after 1st of June, on transition to Scottish Government and our operation uh, with Amy, we've inherited the work programme. We were delivering that. We were strengthening brackets that had been identified. And this fault, quite unrelated, has emerged and Government has taken the swiftest action possible. Jack Bailey, followed by Colin Keogh. And I recognise the frustration for commuters and businesses and indeed the cost to the economy estimated at some £50 million. The First Minister told the press today that there wasn't a cut to the budget. Audit Scotland in their report on FETA said at paragraph 34 that the budget for capital expenditure was cut significantly. Isn't it the case that Audit Scotland are quite right? Plans were made by FETA done in conjunction with Transport Scotland and in the context of reduced budgets. Minister. No, it's not the case that budget decisions have had an impact on this fault. As I say, the expert engineering advice is saying that this fault was not predicted and has only appeared in the last few weeks. And FETA were amending uh, their work programme. Scottish Government have inherited it, were delivering it, and of course we'll see through this necessary repairs. And when it comes to capital grant, there was ongoing uh, investment, and funding this year would be at £10.7 million, matching the programme of works developed by FETA, and has not been subject to any reduction. In addition, it have never restricted funding for critical works. Colin Keir, followed by Sarah Boyer. Can I thank the Minister for his statement and the measures put in place to deal with the closure of the Forth Bridge? Could I ask what actions the Scottish Government are taking to alleviate the difficulties faced by commuters using the already under pressure Dalmeny railway station in my constituency, uh, which is the first halt on the southern side of the Forth Rail Bridge, who are unable to board trains due to capacity issues as well as the local road congestion and parking problems around South Queensferry? Minister. Well, as the extra carriages that have been identified and deployed. There's staffing at stations uh, to support uh, commuters and the travelling public. And we're looking at further enhancing uh, both uh, the number of seats through uh, extra carriages uh, and further amendments to the timetable to support everyone uh, affected uh, on the, the rail line, which has been enhanced to support commuters at this very challenging time. Sarah Boyd, followed by Mike McKenzie. 
Presiding officer, can I follow on that question to ask if consideration will be given to early services? Because one of the bits of feedback I've had is that for many commuters, it's simply not possible to use the train because there aren't early enough services, and that's having a big impact on businesses and companies in the Edinburgh and the public sector in the Edinburgh area. Minister. That's a very reasonable question, of course, because our advice is if people can avoid the peak periods, then that will help alleviate the congestion and, and the busy periods. Therefore, we have extended the timetable for an earlier uh, departure, the 552 service, and we're looking at further enhancing that for earlier trains and overnight trains, if that's possible as well, hopefully to take the number of extra seats provided during the duration of closure to over 10,000 extra seats. So we're actively looking at that, and I'll update uh, members through the, the channels that I've uh, established. Mike McKenzie, followed by Patricia Ferguson. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to ask the Minister, with uh, a greatly increased number of commuters travelling by rail or bus, what discussions he's had with local authorities on relaxation of parking restrictions or in increases in available parking? Minister. Local authorities and indeed Police Scotland have, have been asked and indeed were being proactive in taking all reasonable measures. That might be re um, removing restrictions, uh, supporting uh, uh, parking where appropriate and, and as I said earlier, uh, removing unnecessary roadworks to try and make our road system as accessible as possible. But it's simply not possible to, to display 70,000 vehicles onto the rest of the network and not expect a degree of congestion. That's exactly why we're encourage, encouraging people to car share uh, to avoid travelling if possible, but uh, use public transport. And now in terms of the demand in public transport, rail is in huge demand, so let's add the focus to bus, where there's plenty extra capacity and the prioritisation through the bus and HGV corridor and journey times at around an hour and a half, which is much better than was anticipated. Thank you, Patricia Ferguson, followed by Lewis. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I sympathise entirely with the plight of those in Fife and in other areas that are most directly affected by the closure of the bridge. But the 8,000 additional train spaces that the Minister spoke to have been uh, uh, brought to Fife and to surrounding areas at the cost of some disruption in other parts of the country. So I wonder if the Minister can assure me today that that disruption will be kept to the very minimum and whether he will in future speak with Abellio about the possibility of there being additional spare capacity in terms of rolling stock because the constituents I represent have suffered already uh, in this year disruption to the service between August and November because of engineering works now disruption because of the closure of the fourth road bridge and will during the period of the Egypt project suffer a further 22 weeks disruption. My fear is that they may Thank not Thank you. I think you made the point, Ms Ferguson, Minister. All, all of those disruptive works that Patricia Ferguson's outlined is to achieve the outcome of more trains for Scotland, faster trains, uh, greener trains and enhanced capacity with more seats as well. And indeed, the Edinburgh-Glasgow improvement program will be about that future proofing of the railway. So some of the, uh, the pain and the disruption that people have endured, and I appreciate that, is worth it for that expanded rail service uh, that's been provided in terms of the other disruptive uh, works that are necessary for electrification and the refurbishment um, of Queen Street Station. That's the first point around some of the works earlier this year. On the second point of supporting Fife at this time, I'm sure that the whole country understands that this is an issue of national significance and we do need to pull together to support uh, the region at this time. Again, I appreciate the impact that it's had on some other uh, people, but I think it's important to give the area as much support as we can in what's a very challenging period as a main artery is not uh, in operation. Uh, and finally, uh, in, in terms of that, in terms of the rolling stock, we've used the rolling stock capacity to the max so that we are getting the best out of the railways for the rolling stock that we have. But more trains are ordered and it will be delivered through the new franchise uh, agreement. And I think that that will be a good deal for Scotland. But in terms of the temporary impact, we ask ScotRail to try and identify carriages and rolling stock out with Scotland first before impacting on services within Scotland 
that has been achieved in that some of the rolling stock has come from elsewhere. But yes, there was some impact in some ScotRail services. But as I say, surely we all understand that the Fife area is under considerable pressure and the intervention required it was the right thing to do to pull together as a country and support that region in the way that most other members were encouraging me to do throughout the last few days. Brief Lilith Smith. Would the Minister ask uh, his uh, officials in Transport Scotland if they could ensure that the uh, signposting for diversions is accurate, something that was not the case between the Kearney Hill uh, roundabout and the Kincardin Bridge yesterday? Minister. Yes, of course. We'll try and make sure that all relevant information uh, is accurate and updated in real time. Some of our equipment was subject to vandalism as well, uh, I have to say, but of course we'll try and make sure that all information is up to date as possible. But the nature of this incident and a listening government is that we're changing the travel plan to suit in terms of what's working uh, and what will provide the best intervention. And then all information should flow seamlessly from those decisions. Thank you. That ends the statement from the Minister. I'll just have a short pause while uh, the members get themselves ready for the next item of business.